very much. Glad to see so many people here. It's a pretty large place to try to fill up, but we've actually got a good number of people here, which I'm happy to see. And thanks for the invitation, Doran. It's a pleasure to get a chance to present my work here. So what I'll be talking about today is very broadly networks of proteins and diseases. And the presentation will be in three parts. The first one, I will focus on protein networks, more specifically talking about the string database of which I'm one of the developers. Then I'll move on to talk about a new suite of web resources that I'm involved in developing, having to do with localization of proteins and disease associations to proteins. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about disease networks, looking at more medical informatics data and how we can try to link up that at the molecular level. So starting off with the protein networks, like I said, I'm one of the developers of the string database. So I guess many people in this room are familiar with the database and have tried using it to query with one protein to get associated proteins to perhaps try to predict protein function or putting in a large number of proteins coming out of a microarray study, proteomic study, whatever, to try to see how it's structured into hopefully functional modules, protein complexes, and so on. But where do, I, where do these underlying protein interactions in the string database actually come from? What we have behind string in the current version is more than a thousand genomes. And one thing you can do based on that is to try to do computational predictions. There's a number of different ways that you can predict which genes or proteins are likely to be functionally associated just based on having a large collection of genomes. I don't want to go through all of them in the interest of time, but just mention quickly one of the simplest ones, which is the gene fusion algorithm, just to give you an idea about how these algorithms work. And the very simple idea is, in this case, in this schematic figure, you have four different genomes, and you have two genes of interest, the red gene and the yellow gene. And suppose you're looking in the top genome and there's two different genes, they're sitting different places in the genome, possibly even on different chromosomes. Now you look in other genomes and you find that in fact in some of them, these two genes have been fused into a single protein coding gene that encodes a fusion protein. If you think about this from the point of view of a cell, this, does it make any sense that a cell would take two proteins that are functionally completely unrelated and covalently link them together into a single protein? Well, not really. But the existence of these fusion genes show that, in fact, these two proteins have been fused together, which means that probably, even in the cases when they're not fused, they are functionally associated. These kinds of evidence are particularly abundant if you're looking at bacterial genomes, where you can look not just at protein fusions, but gene neighborhoods, operand predictions, all those kinds of things. But if you're interested in higher eukaryotes, in particular human, you need to move beyond just looking at a collection of genomes and add in other kinds of experimental data. And that's what we are also doing in the string database and have been doing for the past 10 years or so. And perhaps the most obvious kind of experimental data to integrate is physical protein-protein interactions. And we do that, we integrate data from a large number of different assays, and I think that's an important point to make. There's no single assay that is going to give you a complete picture of protein-protein interactions, even if you want to limit yourself to just physical protein interactions. And in string, we go beyond that and look for functional associations as well. So here I'm just showing a brief overview of the protein properties of the proteins that actually have interactions according to three different popular assays for testing protein interactions. The yeast to hybrid assay, the tandem affinity purification followed by mass spectrometry approach, and finally a split enzyme assay. And the interesting thing is you'll see that these things work well for different kinds of proteins. Most notably, the latter assay works pretty well for transmembrane proteins, whereas the two former assays don't. So if you want to get a complete overview of protein interactions, you need to integrate data from many different assays. And you shouldn't necessarily be shocked when you see very poor agreement between different assays, because sometimes it's not because they are, they are each bad, it's just because they each show different subsets of the truth. Now, in addition to computational predictions and looking at um, experimental data, we, of course, also make use of curated knowledge. So if other people have been so nice to go through the literature, the textbooks, and really collect all the textbook knowledge, such as metabolic pathways, into a computer-readable form, we're very happy to use it. So, of course, there are databases like Keck, Metasig, a large number of different pathway databases that capture in a computationally readable form these kinds of metabolic pathway charts that every self-respecting biochemist used to learn by heart for an exam, happily forget, and have hanging as a huge poster on their office wall. 
Unfortunately, if we're interested in human proteins and we're trying to functionally associate those to each other, then judging from the string database, everything I've talked about so far adds up to about 10% of the total evidence. So where's everything else? Well, everything else turns out to be hidden in the scientific literature, and that's really the only reason why I'm interested in text mining. So whereas many people are interested in text mining from a scientific point of view in terms of doing text mining, I'm actually mostly interested in it because most of the data I get comes in the most inconvenient format you could possibly imagine, namely human readable text. And the approach I take to doing text mining is very, very straightforward and very pragmatic. So what I like to use is typically dictionary-based approaches. So in case of finding gene and protein names in text, I need to be able to nail down these names to database identifiers so that I know exactly which protein I'm talking about and not just that this is a name of some protein. So for that reason, I use dictionary-based approaches so that I know all the different synonyms and all the different variants of synonyms, like, for example, if you have a human, human gene name, people might put an H in front of it when they write it in the literature, just to tell that they're talking about the human gene and not the mouse gene with the same name. Once you map that down, done so-called named entity recognition, we tend to move on and then do simple co-mentioning statistics. So what we do there is just that we go through and we count up in how many different abstracts are these two genes, A and B, mentioned together and somehow normalize that for how many abstracts mention A, how many abstracts mention B, and that way we can calculate a score that tells us are A and B mentioned together more often than you'd expect by random chance. And if they are, then it's probably not by random chance that they were co-mentioned. More likely it's because they're somehow functionally associated with each other. Now, when I present it this way, it may sound like creating something like the string database is fairly straightforward. Unfortunately, it turns out there's, a, there's sort of a number of small issues that you need to deal with. One of them is, of course, that not only is there a lot of different types of data that we're trying to integrate, each of them is typically distributed again across many different databases. There's not one place to get all the genomes. There's not one place to get all the known protein-protein interactions. There's not one pathway database. These databases have an ugly tendency to all come in different file formats. They tend to call the same proteins different things. The different data sets tend to be of uh, what I, in politically correct language, call variable quality. That is to say, some of them are really, really bad. And then finally, fundamentally, these things are just not comparable to each other. How do you compare yeast to hybrid assay to co-mentioning in abstract to gene fusion? A lot of these issues, solving them, really, there's, there's not much to say about it. It comes down to hard work. I'm always tempted to replace this slide with one that says graduate students. So uh, it, it's really, there's a lot of databases. Well, somebody's got to have to download them. They come in a lot of different file formats. Well, somebody's going to have to write a lot of parcels. Tough luck. And they call this, the same proteins different things. Somebody's got to make a mapping file. There's not a lot of science to that. There's really a lot of hard work to that then where you need to start being smart about it is dealing with the variable quality. Because even within a single data set, like a, like a large yeast to hybrid screen, different interactions are not going to be equally reliable. And the way we deal with that is to make quality scores. It may sound silly, but it's really a matter of being imaginative and dreaming up some sort of score that you can calculate based on the data at hand. Calculate some sort of number that, given the data at hand, you think this number is going to correlate with whether a certain interaction is likely to be right or wrong. So if you have an example here, this is a tandem affinity purification followed by mass spec. You want to know whether the blue, or the, green protein, and the blue and the green protein are likely to interact with each other. And you have the following purifications, one in which you tag the blue protein, you got the green one and a couple of other proteins. You tag some other protein, you got the blue and the green together. You tagged yet another protein, you got the blue but not the green. You tagged the green, you didn't get the blue. And now I ask you, do you think the blue and the green are in a complex together? Well, it's not clear how the scoring scheme should exactly be, but the, the basic properties of it, I think, are pretty obvious to everybody. The more purifications you see the blue and the green together in, the more likely you are to believe that they interact. The more, into, the more in purifications in which you see only one but not the other, the less likely you are to believe it. So it's, it's pretty obvious what the basic properties of a scoring scheme like that should be. And that's what we do for all the different kinds of evidence. Same thing goes for protein fusions. If you look over the evolutionary tree, how many independent fusion events would you need in order to explain the data you see, so on and so forth. That allows us to rank the interactions that come from a certain type of evidence by confidence. 
But to make them comparable, we need to take another step, and that is calibrate everything against a common gold standard. In String, we've decided that sort of the level of resolution we're aiming for is, to, is that we're happy to link things together that are sort of involved in the same pathway. That kind of level of resolution, that's what we're going for. So for that reason, we use at the moment Keck pathways. We've tried other things as well. It might sort of globally scale the scores a bit, but it doesn't really change what comes out as high scoring and what comes out as low scoring. And when you have that, you can do really the same thing as experimentalists do. You make a calibration curve. You have your raw quality scores, say, from the tandem affinity purification. You do some score bins. Within each bin, you calculate how many of the protein pairs that score between 1.7 and 1.8, whatever that means, how many of those fall on the same pathway map, how many fall on different pathway maps, and that way you turn the number 1.7 into a posterior probability of being on the same pathway. You do that for all the different data, you put all of it together so that you accumulate multiple lines of evidence for the same interaction, and you have your final result. So that's what we're doing in string. What I've more recently started doing in my group is to try to say, can we do the same kind of things for localization and for disease associations? Because this is obviously a completely general approach. So we're developing a whole suite of web resources that sort of take this general approach of taking curated knowledge, combining it with whatever experimental data is available, combining it with text mining for associations between proteins and compartments, tissues, diseases, what have you. Combine it with computational prediction methods if, there was anything, if there's anything around. Assign quality scores to everything, try to make it comparable and also visualize it in a nice way. So just going quickly through it, the compartments database, the starting point for that, the identifier space, we map everything onto here is gene ontology, more specifically the cellular component part of gene ontology. And then for visualization purposes, we're mapping it onto a figure, a schematic figure of a cell like this, where we color things more darkly green, the more evidence we have for the protein being in that particular compartment. We're doing the same kind of thing for tissues, in this case, Looking around at the different ontologies, we ended up deciding to use, at least for the first version, the Brenda tissue ontology. Then mapping various high throughput expression data sets, the human protein atlas, tissue annotations in Uniprot, text mining, all these different things onto these terms, then selecting a certain level in the ontology where we cut it and use that as the basis for making a visualization like this, much like the cell. So an overview of the human body onto which we can color code the evidence that we have for the localization of a given protein that you query for. Similarly for diseases, at the moment the only thing we have in there is text mining, but we're trying to actually expand it with various manual annotations from, these, from databases like Uniprot and so on. And there we're mapping everything onto the disease ontology. That's the, uh, the ontology we chose to use for the purpose. And actually the main reason was that it was a very good starting point for text mining because in contrast to most of the other uh, ways of classifying disease, diseases, they had a lot of synonym information associated with it. It did require a little bit of fixing up in some respects. For example, if you looked for, at something like breast cancer, at least the version we started with, there would be things like BRCA1 being listed as a synonym of breast cancer. Of course, if you're trying to do co-mentioning of diseases with gene names, you wouldn't want BRCA1 to suddenly be a disease name instead of a gene name. So we did some comparisons there to kick out uh, Hugo gene symbols as not being synonyms of diseases and so on. And then we also, because there's an enforced tree structure in the disease ontology, we added some additional links to improve for our purposes the backtracking of evidence. The end result, this is very much how all the web resources look, except most of them have pretty visualizations, is like this. You go and you query for a disease or a protein. In this case, we query for KLK3. And you get a ranked list from text mining of the diseases it's most, most strongly associated with in the literature. And the top scoring one is prostate cancer, which really shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody because KLK3 is the very same thing as what is known as prostate-specific antigen. So uh, it was expected that that's where it should be involved. Another important feature, both in the string database and in all of these resources, is evidence viewers. We always want people to be able to not just use this as a black box, but backtrack to the underlying evidence. So for example, you can click on any interaction between a protein and a disease and immediately say, okay, for this text mining, show me the abstract in which you actually think this gene is co-mentioned with this disease. So you can immediately dive in and look at the evidence and say, is this really right? In addition to having these web interfaces, which are really mainly aimed at the wet lab biologists, people wanting to look up individual genes, individual diseases, 
We also make things available through web services so it can function together with the string database, for example, through the so-called payload mechanism. So you can take a network and then put these colored halos around it, coloring proteins depending on how much evidence there is for each protein being involved in diabetes or being located to the nucleus or being expressed in the liver or whatever you would like to do. And also, it's not on all the resources yet because some of them are still under development. We have download files. I try to make everything available as convenient tab delimited files under as liberal licenses as I can get away with. By that I mean, since I'm integrating a lot of different data, of course I get data under different licenses which put some limitations on what I'm allowed to do. I don't put more restrictions on the data than I have to. Then finally, the last thing I want to talk about today is uh, disease networks moving more towards the medical informatics. What we are lucky to have access to in Denmark is very large scale registries of electronic health records. So capturing various aspects of the data that is really collected whenever you get in contact with the hospital. So the kinds of things that, you, that is recorded in that case is you come into the hospital, of course they record who you are, how old you are, which gender you are. And then depending on which, where you go in the hospital, there might be radiology reports, there might be values from blood samples, there are going to be certainly diagnoses, which diagnosis the doctors assign to you. And of course also the narrative text, all the notes written by the doctors and nurses about you. So fundamentally you can divide this up into two kinds of data. There's the structured data, which is stuff like the assigned diagnosis. So this is really computer readable database information the way we would like to work with it. And then the inconvenient data, the unstructured data, which is the clinical narrative. So this is a Frankenstein record taking sentences from different patients and putting it together because obviously I wouldn't be allowed to show a record of an actual patient to you. And um, then once we have this, we can try to text mine it, do the same kinds of approaches as we do in the literature to identify disease names and so on in the text. Look, for example, at comorbidity, doing simple two-by-two two contingency tables to calculate the comorbidity between diseases, and then do these large heat maps, a lot of diseases versus a lot of diseases, which ones correlate, like if, you're more li if you get people who get A are more likely to also get B, or negative correlations, people who get A are less likely to get B. Again, there's a number of issues to deal with. As you might have noticed from one of the slides I showed, it's in Danish which of course means that all of these nice uh, dictionaries that people have been developing in the US for mining medical records are pretty useless to us because all our text is in Danish. Then you have of course a massive multiple testing problem when you're trying to test every, dis every possible disease against every possible disease. You have to deal with all kinds of confounding factors. If you just do the simple two by two contingency table like I suggested, then the most significant correlations you get out is that breast cancer correlates with um, with all kinds of birth complications. The uh, relative risk is two, and the reason is called women. Um, of course, since men don't get either, then you have more co-occurrence than you'd expect by naive random chance. So of course, you correct for age and gender, and then things start to look more sensible. But still, you have all kinds of issues with reporting biases. For example, there are certain things that may only be discovered if you're subjected to a certain kind of analysis, like imaging, uh, at the hospital, which you will only be examined in that way if you are suspected of suffering from some other disease. So there's a lot of issues of analyzing this. But we're doing this, we're finding a lot of interesting correlations between diseases, and what we're trying to do with that is to combine that with all the resources I've just talked about to try to go back to the molecular basis, so linking these diseases that show comorbidity, linking them down to the genetic level or protein level, combining that with protein-protein interactions, so with, with protein disease links, and further with protein networks to hopefully be able to explain why we see the comorbidities we actually see. So with that, I just want to acknowledge a lot of collaborators. I obviously didn't do this alone. The String Database is a long-running project. It had already been running for many years in Pierre Borg's group at the EMBL by the time I joined his lab. These days, very much of the work is going on in Christian von Mehring's group in Zurich now, and lots of people have contributed over the years. The text mining and all the other resources about compartments and tissues and so on, again, lots of people contributing on that. Key people being involved in this text mining project was Sean O'Donoghue with the Reflect project, which I haven't talked about, and also Sune Frankil in my group, who's contributed a lot on that. 
The electronic health record mining has mainly been the work of uh, PhD students Robert Eriksson, Peter Bjelstrup Jensen, and Anders Böck Jensen, and uh, very much was the mastermind of, uh, of Søren Brunak. And with that, I just want to thank for your attention. I am happy to take questions, and finally, I'll do some shameless plug that we are running a big conference in Copenhagen in not very long. Thank you. Before we get to the questions, Michal Linial from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who actually masters this entire session of special sessions, will say a few words. Uh, hi, everybody. Very short, because I don't want to take uh, time from the questions. So just uh, to say that uh, as a uh, part of the organization and the chair of the special session, first of all, uh, I want to thank Doron for organizing this session. This is a small token of appreciation from the society. And uh, so it's a good time for applause, even that we are just in the middle. Please. Thank you. And more important, uh, just uh, in case you have great idea for a special session, come to me or to the booth of the ISCB. Just put your name, the title, and we'll contact you. So please be courageous of presenting crazy topics because that's what we are looking for. Thank you. And uh, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> Crazy you. topics like disease bioinformatics. <laughs> Thank you, Michal. And now for the questions. Come to the microphone. Hi. Uh, really great talk, by the way. And um, just for the sort of medical records that you're text mining and getting data, right? So how do you deal with missing or sparse data because you know how you, how you said that there are certain records that you keep, like gender, obviously, that's going to be sort of, everyone's going to have one, hopefully. Um, and, and like with stuff like medication, for example, like you'll find it that some people do take medication, some people just won't have that record at all. So how do you deal with that missing information? Yeah, you just have to accept that it ain't there. Um, in terms of medication, it's actually even worse. If you go to the central registry that we're mining for comorbidity, we don't even have information about medication at all. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a big problem. Um, in terms of diagnosis, I guess you can safely assume that if people didn't, as, weren't assigned a certain diagnosis, they didn't have it, at least not to a degree where they went to the hospital and they were examined. You have to make that assumption. But certainly the biggest problems, I think, is all the things where it's not so much sparse, but like entire columns and the matrix that are missing, for example, I don't know in this, in this big cohort called everybody in Denmark, I don't know who's smoking. And of course, I'm going to have a lot of trivial comorbidities where A is comorbid with B simply because you have an increased risk of both A and B if you smoke. But I don't know who's smoking, so I can't correct for that in the statistics. But that's really the biggest issue. What about the side effects? What about side effects? We are doing a lot of research on that actually. We just submitted a paper very recently. So looking at uh, temporal correlations, that's something we've done. So we are lucky from some of the hospitals where we have all the written records, we can do text mining in the electronic patient records in the written text for adverse drug reactions using a dictionary we compiled ourselves. And then combine that with the structured information in the EHR systems on which patients were on which drugs during which periods of time. Then we do temporal correlation analysis and say, are there some ADRs <coughs> that show, out, show up uh, suspiciously or often shortly after people start to take a certain drug? And that way we're actually able to find adverse drug reactions of drugs that are not listed in the package inserts. Can this tell us something about diseases and their relationships? We haven't used it directly like that, but certainly it's one, it, sometimes it is one of the explanations. So it's, we're very lucky to have a pharmacologist in the group. And uh, that helps us a lot because sometimes you see comorbidity between two diseases and you can say it's trivial because if you get A, you're going to get this drug and B is an adverse drug reaction of that. So that's often a trivial explanation, but it's difficult to get that in a really structured form and put it in and automatically filter for it. At the moment, we do it by manually looking at it and having knowledgeable people. Lars, a uh, great talk. Uh, I would like to know if your text mining like um, approach would be applied also for um, clinical trial information records, like because they are usually more standardized than the medical uh, records. And 
eventually it could be applied also for the prospective studies. Do you have something to? We haven't really used the text mining per se, but we have tried to use it to help us map down, for example, the adverse drug reactions from clinical trials. We've been doing a little bit of work on that. At the moment, we're writing up something on comparing um, what was found in clinical trials in European side versus US side on the same drugs. So we're looking at those kinds of things, but we haven't really done it by, by text mining as such, because typically you could actually get this information in tables. You didn't really need to deal with human readable text. You could identify the right tables. And typically you had to anyway pull it out semi-manually because these tables were not structured in a systematic way. The tables would be structured in completely different ways for different drugs, even from the same reporting agency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last speaker will set up.